Well, hi there, friends. If you're seeing this, you're somebody who enjoys either the free video or you're listening to our free podcast feed. And the very first thing we want to say is thank you so much. Without you, we wouldn't be anywhere. All of our listeners are important to us, and it is amazing to see this community continue to grow and grow. If you do enjoy Padres Hot Tub, if you've listened to the show for many a week, many a month, maybe many a year, there's a way that you can help support us in doing what we do. This is an independent show. Uh, We are not backed by anybody. We are backed by ourselves, and we're backed by our listeners at patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Padres Hot Tub. Uh, We are a patron-supported show. People can join uh, as a patron for free, but uh, for as low as $5 a month, you get all kinds of good benefits. We have a $12 and $30 level as well, where the benefits certainly accrue. But, uh, Rafi, why is it important for people to support the show? Or uh, not why is it important? It's important because it helps us. What benefits do people get for supporting the show? Well, the first benefit is that you wouldn't be hearing this right now if you were a patron, uh, because our Big. patrons uh, get uh, ad-free uh, content, all of our content ad-free. You get bonus content. We just uh, recorded a banter podcast that uploads weekly right before our Padres Hot Tub podcast, just to kind of check in, see how the three of us are doing over the course of the week, talk about what's going on in our lives and the world, everything like that. Um, if you like our group therapy shows, which appear on our audio feeds, which is our kind of like weekly, I don't know, weekly talk radio sort of call-in show that we have with our patrons. You can get that exclusively and participate if you are a patron. You join our Discord, which is our online community. It is better than any Twitter, Reddit, MySpace, if you're still on there, social network that you can have, Facebook in terms of getting your Padres talk. Everyone there is a patron. They support the show. They care a lot about the team. They're informed. Uh, and you know, if you're supporting us at the higher levels, you get free t-shirts, you get priority access to baseball games in season, uh, whether you're in San Diego or, you know, maybe we can link up with you when we're, you know, traveling to other ballparks as we go along, lots of, lots of good stuff coming in there. Am I forgetting anything guys? No, I think you've hit the most of it. The discord is certainly, I think the, the biggest unlock, uh, for folks, cause the, let's be honest, social media stinks. So having a cool community that you can go to that will both keep you informed for baseball, which our Discord absolutely will, uh, and will also give you a place to talk without feeling like a complete jack wagon. Uh, That's what the Discord is for you. So, hey, check it out. Find out for yourself. Make a decision for yourself. Patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Padres Hot Tub. See the different levels. See if you'd like to support. Hot tub, everybody. Greg Elston, Chris Green, Rafi Cantor. These guys, these guys with their crazy gyrations. When we Bobby have to Cressy play it in our heads. On. We miss it. We got to just get that thing playing over us. I mean, it is for everybody who's listening to this. No, we need a live band every <laughs> we, Monday we need, night. We, we need a pocket Bobby Cressy. Just pop yes. out of my little Hockey pocket. pocket. <laughs> and just come out and just play a little ditty for us. Uh, Listen, whenever someone gets, yeah, when someone gets to the five million dollar catch and kill level, we will then hire Bobby <laughs> Cressy every Monday night just to hang out with us and to play the some last tunes. Monday night. <laughs> yeah. yeah, precisely on the final show, we'll just let Bobby play us out. Um, all right, we've got to. Hey, you're welcome, folks. It's the Optimism Podcast. It's best case scenarios. If you didn't like last week's show, this is the show for you. If you loved last week's show, you might want to check in with us in a couple of weeks because everything's <laughs> coming up Millhouse today on Padres Hot Tub. It's just <laughs> going to be that kind of show. A um, couple really quick points for our general audience, but also our Patreon audience. Uh, for the folks who are in our Patreon community, we are in the process of recruiting for a, believe it or not, sixth fantasy league the fifth oh, tier boy. of our promotion relegation we're now to the wrexham tier 
the fifth tier, yeah. uh, an, an E league, uh, is, is a B C D and E league is being recruited right now. There's almost enough people for a draft. They're going to do a one night draft, uh, at the end of March. So you haven't missed anything, but if you are interested in that and you're in the Patreon community, make sure to hit up Monty, uh, the commissioner of commissioners, the jefe de la jefe, uh, and he will, uh, he will set you up. Uh, what's the latest on the latest baseball card break, Chris? We are doing PHT breaks five in the next week and a half or so. $40 gets you a spot in a break that includes seven different boxes. So uh, anybody who's in our Patreon, go to the Baseball Cards channel for more information or the, uh, the PHT breaks thread in that channel. And lastly, Group Therapy is back. We've been taping Group Therapies on Thursdays on our Patreon Discord. So take a look for that as we are back to two episodes a week in the free feed. That's it. Look how quick housekeeping was. Done. Just like that. Poof. Done. Let's get to the news. Best case scenarios to come. First, the latest out of Padre Spring Training in Peoria, which as we record this, Monday, March 11th, has hmm, about 36 hours left. About 36 <laughs> hours <laughs> left in Padre Spring Training. Because after Wednesday afternoon's game, the team is getting on a plane. 31 players plus coaching staff, et cetera, are flying 13 hours to Seoul, South Korea. There'll be a day or two of adjustment. There will be a couple of exhibition games, which are kind of interesting. Uh, and then March 20th, March 21st, in the dead of night, it'll be the Padres and the Dodgers. 3.05 a.m. first pitches uh, from Seoul, South Korea. We now know the matchups. Game one, Yu Darvish versus Tyler Glass now. And game two, Joe Musgrove versus Yoshinobu Yamamoto. So uh, we've got that. That's locked in. Any thoughts, any feelings? I love you, Darvish, starting opening day for the Padres. I always have. Um, that It's just a fun thing. He's going to have... Uh, you know, I'd imagine quite a supporters contingent. Uh, it is just kind of incredible. This streak of truncated or just weird spring trainings. The Padres have been on, like it has not been a normal spring training seemingly since Fernando Tatis jr. Made the team in 2019. Not seemingly literally, <laughs> literally, right? 2020 COVID 2021 yeah. COVID camp. 2022 yeah. lockout 2023 WBC. Yeah. There hasn't been one normal spring training since 2019. For it's the like Padres. a defense against the dark arts teacher position at Hogwarts. You know, it just doesn't happen, con you know, consecutive years. Um, We'll see what it means. Don't know what it means. Done trying to guess what it's going to mean. I can't wait for the, I can't wait to be in the dark of my house three or five in the morning. Yeah, I've just been complaining like about the entire thing. Like it's like we have a bad spring training. We can't get the team together. It's like you know we we're still figuring out our roster. We're gonna have to wake up at three in the morning and you know watch the game and everything. But like deep down, I mean like baseball is gonna be back. Like how mad can I be? How upset can I be? Do I have like qualms and questions about this team? Of course. But at the end of the day, like we're all here. We all talk to each other multiple times a week. Because we like watching this team play baseball, so how mad can I be that the Padres are going to be playing again? So uh, I'm I'm excited, guys. Ask me after the first inning how mad I can be. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a different answer. Uh, well, as we barrel toward that game at the dead of night in Korea, uh, decisions are being made apace inside Padres camp. And given that by 100% intention and design, nobody was brought into camp with a realistic chance to compete for a job. Shockingly, two of A.J. Preller's prized prospects are in line to win opening day starting lineup jobs with the club. Jackson Merrill has been in line to be the Padres center fielder for well over a week now, every time he's started, it's been in center field. Nobody outside San Diego thinks this is a real thing. They're all confused. They're waiting for the Padres to sign somebody. The Padres aren't going to sign anybody 
Jackson Merrill is going to be the starting center fielder until he fails at the job or until the season ends. Like, I don't think there's really any other way about it. Um, And for anybody who was concerned about that, allow me to tell you, Jackson Merrill hit a hanging curveball in Peoria for a home run today. Right after so, he saw another hanging, he saw one hanging curveball go in for a strike, and then that very next pitch displaying the hit tool that we've heard so much about. Right. So Jackson Merrill hit a home run, so shut up of your face. He's obviously great. And 30 30 season incoming. Incoming. Like, I mean, somebody asked me today on the radio the likelihood that he wins rookie of the year, and I was like, pretty low. But, you know, hey. Merrill getting the center field job has been a fait accompli, let's be honest, since the start of spring training, it, it, at least for him to earn an outfield job. We've talked about it on previous shows. It was an engineered competition. The idea that the number one prospect in the system is going to lose out to Cal Mitchell, Oscar Mercado, or Tim LaCastro is ridiculous. It would be yeah. A.J. Preller admitting defeat before things started. That was never going to happen. Graham Pauly winning an opening day job is shocking yeah. to me. It is absolutely shocking to me. And on Monday morning, the club assigned Jacob Marcy to minor league camp, a very appropriate move for a kid who had barely touched double A. Graham Pauly barely touched double A. He played 20 games in double A. He was a high A player last year last year he was in the same league as ethan salas last year and he's gonna be the starting third baseman for the padres on opening day and in today's lineup he was hitting sixth so i i don't know how to feel i'm sick of being cassandra and, and being back here in the corner going it's it's a problem it's a problem like Maybe these kids are going to hit. Maybe they're not. They are going to play, though. The Padres, the Padres never, honestly, I think, were actually thinking about doing the simple steps that they could take to improve the club. They're going to play these two kids, and they're going to save the maximum amount of money. Yeah, that's right. It's. I mean, it just comes. I'm. I've gone from bargaining to acceptance in the last week since we spoke about Merrill. Uh, mostly Merrill. I don't think I'm there yet with Pauly. Um, you know, I, I was curious just perusing, perusing the, uh, spring training stats before we hopped on, um, the Padres only have three qualified hitters, uh, in spring training so far. And those three hitters are Jackson, Merrill, Graham Pauly, and Eki Rosario. And, uh, Merrill and Pauly have basically identical offensive outputs there. Merrill has a 931 OPS. Pauly has a 933 OPS and Rosario is down at a 770 OPS, which is not terrible and it's like not much it's kind of what i would expect from eggy rosario uh for being honest but um you know the question about who's going to play third base on opening day was going to be probably between Polly and rosario at this point and i understand why the team is putting grand Polly there they need he's got that lefty bat he's got some pop to it um i feel ridiculous i mean it it's march 11th guys they play a game in nine days like what like, it's ridiculous at this point to be like well maybe they're gonna sign someone or like what they, they would have signed someone already like they would have like i i just i just don't you know a trade is possible maybe but why would you uh need when the market has been down for weeks why would you kneecap someone's ability to come to this team and succeed by giving them precious days and weeks in spring training? Um, and just wait to sign them until now if you were going to sign someone. I just I just don't think it's in the plan. This is the Optimism Podcast, so I am still thinking they could sign a left fielder. And I always hated Jackson Merrill for that position, and that's what the narrative was coming into spring training or before it, was that he could be slated in to be the left fielder. And I like him a lot more in center than I do in left. Um, I do want to point out that while Graham Pauly only has a limited amount of bats in double A, he played baseball for Duke in the ACC, yeah. a level which people compare to double A. And he's shown up in his first Major League Baseball spring training camp, and he's faced Major League pitching, and he's done quite well with it. 
Uh, he's not who I thought I didn't think that was going to happen. Like you guys have heard me talk about Marcy and his elite walk rate. That's what I'm into. Uh, AJ Preller is into big bats and the stick hitting the ball really hard. And that's what Grant Pauly has done all spring long. He's not going to be asked to be the club's full-time third baseman. He's going to be asked to be the third baseman for, you know, maybe a game or two or weeks. If that is, as we were assuming it is what's going to happen. Um, So not too worried about it. I think it's kind of a beneficial circumstance that this club has rebuilt the farm system. They have prospects who can play. And one of them is happening to play some great ball at a time when they're going to need somebody at third base for a little while. And he did have competition. I mean, have you guys not seen what Tyler Wade has done this spring? That's my point. Tyler Wade, Eggy Rosario, Matt Batten. You know, it's it's, it's not peace, exactly Matt Brandon. Belt. We loved you. you know, it's it's not exactly Brandon Belt. Just like for for Merrill, it's not exactly Michael A. Taylor or Adam Duvall that he's beaten out. It, it's nobody. Sure, it, I, I think he will play. Like I would put low odds, like I mean, good odds that Merrill will have a 700 OPS at the end of the year, assuming he gets a full year, which is a huge assumption because it's tough and you know you need to stay healthy but i i am not crying that they did not get michael a taylor and it's the optimism podcast i'm not giving up hope in belt or fam like maybe the numbers are coming down and aj scott is out like i have to assume that these guys have offers from teams and like every major league baseball vet has said this year they're just all low ball because the owners are colluding i mean not definitely not colluding it's just how they're getting valued these days. It's no collusion. Yeah, they, they just all have the same algorithm with the same password, as I think yes, Hernandez yeah. said. <laughs> yes. uh, it's not a collusion at all. It's just a sharing of data. Um, yeah. I, I don't need to kvetch about Marilyn Pauly here. I'm doing it every day, pretty much on the radio. It's, it's a really shitty place to be to be honest, because it, uh, I padre- disagree because last year, what were we complaining about? We were complaining about two old DHs. We were complaining about Rugen and Odor. Like now we're getting what we asked them to do. Rebuild the team with young controllable talent. And it just happens to be that now is when it's happening. And now is when Jackson Merrill is going to have to start his playing time. Uh, I, I, I still I think that's- it's a year early. Yes, they thank you, Craig. We will see. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure what a year. I think it would help him defensively. I worry about putting the guy in a new position his first year in the big leagues and in a completely new position. That I worry about. But I I'm not worried it, yeah. about him against major league pitching. He's going to have to learn to get to, used to it sooner or later. And I think he's up to the task. Well, we'll find out because he's going to be up to the he's going to be in the task, whether he's up to it or not. He's going to be in the lineup and we're going to find out Uh, that 700 OPS is interesting. I would probably take the bet for the under on that because he's a 20 year old with nowhere near enough seasoning, jumping two levels while changing positions to take on major league breaking balls and, and off speed stuff that he's never seen in his life. He's never seen anything even remotely approaching what big league pitchers have. And Graham Pauly is in the exact same position, except he even had 20 fewer games in double a. So uh, these guys are in for a rude awakening. There's no question about it. What Padre fans need to recognize in my opinion is that this is a thing that is happening. So you know, what we deal with on the radio, which is not the same as a podcast, is every day people going like, this team's going to be great. Merrill's ready. Paulie's ready. This is it. We're set. Why would we ever want anyone else? We've got the best players. We're going to win it all. And then literally three days into the season, they'll be like, fire Mike Schilt, fire AJ Preller, <laughs> trade Jackson Merrill, trade Graham Pauly, trade somebody else, give up on everything. And I'm like, you can't be on the yo-yo like this. I'm going to stay consistent and say that we are putting undercooked things out onto the the serving area for Major League Baseball. And there's it's n- it's not going to be pretty for these two players. Now, if Jackson Merrill is truly one of the elite prospects in the history of baseball 
then he will do something that's almost never happened in the history of baseball, which is starting as a center fielder at age 20, skipping two levels and jumping in and waiting and not drowning in the water. If that happens, A.J. Preller deserves every bleeping ounce of credit that is due to come his way. If Graham Pauly can make this transition, he deserves every ounce of credit that is due for making bold, dramatic decisions and literally turning down major league players to put these players uh, in into his lineup and succeed. If it happens, I will be here to celebrate it. I will say that I was wrong. I was stupid. I was short-sighted and I should have kept the faith. And until that happens, I'm going to say these are undercooked players and, and there's going to be a problem at some point in the month of April when people are like, this, this, that, this, that. Yeah, yeah. Paul I, might I, play ten games. Like if he, him making the opening day roster, likely that doesn't mean he's going to be up for long. Like Manny Machado is the team's third baseman. They still need and, a DH though. The second Manny's not the DH. They need a DH because there's no DH on this team. Brett Sullivan isn't going to cut it, even though his nickname is Booty. What are you talking about? Brett Sullivan is hitting. He's got a over eight hundred OPS this spring. He's well, absolutely destroying the world. He's on fire. 879, 22 at bats. He's ready to play left field too, Craig. They have him out there now. What were you going to say, Rafe? It's a <laughs> I, me, I, left fielder. I was going to ask uh, what you guys think Trent Grisham's career OPS is. Because he had a crazy 2020, but that won't weigh too heavy. He did good in 2021. It was well over seven. I'm going to put 720. I was going to, I'll take under like 705, maybe. 699. So almost 700, exactly. Yeah. And I bring that up because, like, if, if Jackson Merrill gets a 700 OPS, I'll be thrilled, like, in his first year in center field. But he's not going to play as good of a center field as Trent Grisham. And this whole thing no. is just symptomatic of the larger. I mean, again, it's like I this is the optimism pod. I promise once we get to the optimism pod, I'll be I'll put on a smile and everything will be sunshine. But like the the reason Jackson Merrill, the reason we're doing this is because the team is cheap. And I just like I think we have to keep saying that because like it's not uh, like we are being sold a bill of goods in a way. Uh, and yes, like we have been agree. all off season. And so it's, that's where I think my, mine and Craig's anger is stemming from or frustration. Well, it's so crazy that I felt this anger literally the day the Soto trade happened. And you guys were the opposite. You guys were like, no, the arms coming back are great. And that money's going to go. And I'm like, no, you don't, you're not trying to win in 2024 if you trade Juan Soto. And I find it interesting that I've come around a little bit more from that initial anger, I guess it's because you guys were operating under the assumption that the money would be immediately invested. Correct. Back in free of free agency. At least half of it. Yes. Yeah. I, like with the young guys coming up and the, the moves, the team made the, you know, the, the moves of the checker pieces at the end of last year, I didn't see that as a guarantee. Now I am still operating optimistic pod under that. They, I'm going to make my projection with the assumption that the team makes moves. It may not be Brandon Belt. It may not be Tommy Pham. But it's going to be that the opening day roster of the 2024 San Diego Padres is not the roster come October. Okay. Okay. Well, I would agree with that. The roster will change definitely by October. Now, we might have sold five pieces off of the roster. But that would be a different show. That would have been last week's show. Back to in the news. Uh, four and five starting positions, guys, in the rotation. I'm here to tell you this is settled. Uh, they're going to continue to say that this is a battle going forward, but it was a fight between four guys, and two guys are dramatically outperforming the other two guys. So if it actually was a competition, the competition's over. Because Matt Waldron has been the Padres' best starter in camp. He has been the most stretched out. He has had dominant outings. His last time out, he scattered hits and still was able to get through an outing, allowing only one run. Uh, Matt Waldron, I believe, has earned his spot in the Padres starting rotation. And I'll, you know, I'll just remind the audience, if you missed it like a month or two ago, like 
I'm all about this. I, I really do. I, you know, Rafi used to be the the you know marching leader, the baton holder of the Waldron Cauldron, but I, I'm telling you, like I think he is the best positioned physically, mentally, performance to step into a starter's role in Major League Baseball. He threw 135 innings last year. He's got the the physical stamina to be able to ramp up and play. And his results have been good. He might get nuked out of out of the universe. He might give up 100 runs to the Giants on opening weekend and we'll never hear his name again. But he's earned this spot. He's earned this chance. And I'm excited to see him pursue it. Yeah. And I uh, I want to just say in contrast to uh, Merrill and Pauly, um, Waldron has gotten major league innings before. Johnny Brito has gotten major league innings before. So like, while I, I don't think that having these guys be our four and five starters is the move that a, like a truly like surefire playoff contending team makes, it's not to me as egregious as what they're doing on the offensive side of things by, by double promoting players out of camp. Um, the, the thing that I find really interesting about Brito is that he was always kind of the upside case, I think, uh, in terms of like the the Vasquez and, and Brito of it all in the Soto trade, where it's like this guy's, you know, basically he was projected to be a fifth starter, but he had that little like plus, you know, 40 plus ranking to him, which is just signifying that he has the upside there to try and contribute. And I mean, like, I mean, you look at the difference between uh, Brito and Waldron's numbers. Yeah, Brito has a, a, a slightly higher ERA, but Brito's also striking out, you know, 50% more guys. And so that's what it's going to be. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the Waldron of it all, I don't need to, you know, try and uh, uh, you guys have heard me talk about him enough. I, I love him. I know Dr. Cota loves him. I, I know uh, Padres Apologist and the Discord loves him, founding members of the Cauldron. Uh, the only thing I'll say is, if there were any place as a pitcher where I would want to get a soft landing on my feet as a starting pitcher in baseball, it would be April Petco Park where the marine la- the ball hasn't warmed up yet. The marine layer is heavy. Like it's going to knock down those fly balls. And uh, I-, I think Matt Waldron has the opportunity to surprise us all this year. And I'm really excited by it. Marine layer is certainly heavy. Camp Pendleton, MCAS Marimar in the city. Um, I was not buying into Waldron at all, um, but he has proved his point, and you're completely right. The dude should be the number four starter opening day. Now, Johnny Brito, on the other hand, I had been very intrigued. I've got uh, got one of his cards right here, him looking you know, pretty damn sharp in the pinstripes, I gotta say. It is a look. Um, the dude is striking out way more people than he typically does. That could be spring training guys just wanting to get their swings in, but I can't wait to see his actual, uh, the data from his pitches from his horizontal and vertical movement. Cause it seems like the ball is jumping right out of his hand and hitters aren't quite ready for it. Somebody in the discord kind of likened him to looking a bit like a Blake Snell in that, uh, as soon as hitters start taking pitches, he might be in a little bit of trouble with the walks because they're swinging at a lot of stuff that's breaking out of the zone. But I liked a lot what I saw out of his start the other day where he went four and two thirds against the angels struck out Mike trout twice, both those at bats. He looked like a guy who was overmatching Mike trout, who has not had a great spring and struck out a lot, but that's what you want in a pitcher. If you see a guy that you're overmatching, be aggressive, go after him, like his mindset. And, uh, you know, I think the Padres with, Joe Musgrove and you Darvish topping the rotation and the kind of wild card that is Michael King. It's a far cry from the days of 2019 where Eric Lauer's pitching opening day. Um, the rotation, while not, I would love to see a vet piece, like you said, Rafi, I'd love to have Michael Lorenzen just as insurance. You know, if he was garbage, he could go, but just to have somebody with a little bit more experience a little bit more depth there um they're they're not the part of the team i'm most worried about when there's winners in a race there's losers uh pedro avila who has just gotten shelled all spring has gotten shelled 
by the way, he's gotten shelled throughout his minor league career. He's gotten shelled almost every spring training. And he's had two trips to the big leagues. And he's been shockingly effective in both. And he's pitched way over his strand rate in both. Um, Avila right now, to me, is a ticking time bomb on the Padres 26-man roster. I am very much afraid that the Padres are overvaluing to what appear to be from the outside or analytically looking at it, fluky, just untoward uh, short stints in baseball and rating that as something incredibly important. I think if Pedro Avila was designated for assignment and the Rockies picked him up, we would be completely fine facing Pedro Avila any random ass day that we showed up at Coors Field or that the Rockies showed up here. I don't think he'd ever be missed in the organization were he to be claimed. However, I am worried that a very decent pitcher is going to be held or is going to be released uh, in order to keep Pedro Avila for the, oh no, well, just in case, what if? And right now that's Jeremiah Estrada, the, the spin rate king. He's been really, really good uh, in spring training this year. Wusako has been terrible in spring training this year, gave up a, a cycle his last time out in an inning. Uh, but it's like, well, we signed go and, you know, Avila's out of options. So Estrada's just shit out of luck. I don't, I would really like to see the Padres go the other direction on this, take a chance on a strong arm and take a chance that Pedro Avila is what every other aspect of his career has told us that he is a mediocre, barely quad a pitcher. I think AJ Preller will Craig. I think Jeremiah Estrada is going to make this team. I think Pedro Avila will be off of it. I do have a little bit of confusion with uh, Wusuk Go's uh, optionality because, as I understand it, he can go to the minors but has to approve such an assignment. And I don't know if that, if he refuses, that voids his contract, or I don't know the ins and outs of that. But I do understand that he can go to the minors. That and it was pointed out in the Discord that he, at the when he first signed, he was concerned with making the team as number one thing. And I don't think he has. I don't think he's earned it. No. That's for sure. He hasn't had much time, though. He hasn't had a lot of appearances. But then again, we're playing a short spring training. So, you know. That's how it is. When guys like Stephen Kolick, uh, the Rule 5 draft pick, have showed up, you know, in his limited innings, what does he have? He's had... uh, I'll find it in a second, but not not a ton as well. I think he was around six, four and four and two thirds. He has, but he hasn't given up the earned run in those four and two thirds. So they went out and got him too. They may not have paid him the two million dollars, whatever, but they also only paid Usa Go two million dollars. Uh, it's obvious that he might be a little bit of a project, and his contract reflects that. I don't think it's guaranteed he makes the team at all. I mean, th- listen, we're going to go play two games in Korea. I think Usuko is going to be playing in Korea, or at the very least will be on the roster. Um, I do. I'm trying to, to pull up his game logs, but he's only thrown three and a third innings uh, so far in spring. And so I'm really reticent to, you know, make a- any sort of determination about like whether or not this guy is good off three and a third inning. And, you know, just for uh, to point out, by the way, that that really was just yesterday's game. Like he had a three year RA going into today's game. So, uh, right. you know, I, I don't want to overreact off of, you know, one uh, a third of an inning, you know, which he just got he got blown up. Like, that's just what it is. Rafe, he got blown he has up, he got twice the game. ERA that Robert Suarez has. So that's good for Robert Suarez, right? Right. Uh, his, his ERA is 8.2. Oh, okay. So it's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's bad. Yeah, it's, it's bad for Robert Sports. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't even think it's, it's fair to say that he hasn't earned that Usuko hasn't earned a spot on the team because again, it's been three and a third innings and I don't know. I trust Ruben Yebel to make that decision. And if, you know, obviously it's up to Usuko if he wants to go down to El Paso and get that assignment. But if Niebla is saying that he's good, like I trust Ruben with my life. So this is uh, we'll, this we'll... is Ben Stiller after getting told no touching of the heron face. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Exactly. Uh, last thing 
before we get to predictions is that, uh, you know, looking at the bench, uh, when we talked about Graham Pauly, you know, implicit in that is that Manny Machado was starting the year at DH. I don't think that's a surprise to like literally anybody. Um, but that is going to be the case. Manny's going to start at DH. I think he'll be DH in the, the American opening day too on the 28th. I think he's going to be a DH for a little while as, as he gets back from elbow surgery. He's throwing at spring training. He's throwing against a padded thing on the fence, which is just whatever. Um, but Tyler Wade, Uber journeyman, looking into his eighth year in Major League Baseball. When you look up Tyler Wade, it's pretty wild. He's got like all these years of 75 games, 80 at bats <laughs> with the yeah. Yankees. <laughs> like he was just hanging around to, to pop in in the ninth inning or something. I don't, I don't even know, but uh, he's not a hitter. I know he's hit decent in spring training. That's cool. Uh, if he sticks around to the big leagues, you know, he'll hit all of nothing uh, for the Padres. But frankly, I'd rather have him than Brett Sullivan on the bench every day of the week. I disagree. I think Tyler Wade is Rugnet Odor V2.0. The dude has a negative career war. I think he's on a team just absolutely laden with talented infielders. I know he's got the left-handed thing going for him, and the Padres have really left themselves up a creek without a paddle in that regard. But Brett Sullivan's left-handed too. Uh, I was making jokes earlier about him being in left field, by the way. And Luis Camposano has a really adequate backup catcher in Kyle Higashioka. But if you do want to give Luis Campusano more DH days, especially if they're facing lefties, Brett Sullivan at least gives you the option to have a backup catcher on your bench uh, without getting into the weird DH rules. I know that's probably not worth the roster spot, but I would rather have Oscar Mercado too. Uh, he's come up. This is a dude that has actually played pretty decently at times in his career. In his first year in St. Louis with Mike Schilt, he was a, a positive war player. Career, he's got positive war. He also has showed up in camp. Hasn't played bad at all. Uh, he he beat out our our beloved uh, Tim LeCastro pretty handily, pretty easily. Um, you know, let's see what he's been doing. It's been because it's been good. Twenty one at bats, uh, one daughter, couple home runs. Those were all in one game though. But what I like is that the the strikeouts have been pretty low. Uh, three for uh, twenty one at bats, and that's something he's done his entire career. If you look at his sliders. He doesn't have a high strikeout rate. He's putting the ball in play. He's got a little bit more pop than our beloved Jose Azokar, who homered today. Um, but I just tend to think that the Padres' infield is so deep. Eggy Rosario fills a lot of holes. Jacob Cronenworth can fill a lot of holes. Brett Sullivan can play first base. Um, I don't want friggin' uh, I always confuse him with Taylor Wade, but I don't want Tyler Wade on the team. He just feels like Rugnet Odor Viv two, and I want this team to learn from its mistakes. Uh, I uh, I'm gonna just pause it one thing, which is that Ed Eggy Rosario has one option year left, and Tyler Wade doesn't have options. Uh, and the the thing is, is that this team is in need of of lefty hitting, and Tyler Wade can also play anywhere on the field. Uh, you know, I think much like Graham Polly being at third base is a is an impermanent assignment, it's a temporary assignment. I think Tyler Wade being on the team is a temporary assignment, but I think while, you know, basically we're going to need someone to back up the backup because the backup's going to be playing third base. Um, so I think that that's going to be Tyler Wade uh, while, uh, you know, Polly's playing third base when Manny Machado resumes his fielding. I think they're going to make an assessment. Um, you know, who knows? Like if, you know, we're, if we're transitioning into optimism mode, maybe Graham Polly is amazing and then he's earned his way back on, you know, to stay on the team. And then we're just an embarrassment of riches right now. And we have to figure out what to do um, more than like more likely than not. I would imagine Polly maybe goes back to, to the minor leagues and, and we figure it out from there. OK, there's the news. There's all the latest that's fit to discuss regarding the Padres roster. We've got two more spring training games and then it's off to Korea. So now it's time to put on our happy hats to turn the sunshine up to 10. And to deliver our best case scenarios. If you missed it last week, we delivered our worst case scenarios. 
I hope you missed it. It was depressing. It left me in a bummer mood. I'm looking forward to showing up to work for Annie and Elston tomorrow in a great mood as we talk about our best case scenarios for 2024. And we will start. I thought it was Rafi we were starting with today. We're starting no, with you, Chris. Me. Rafi okay, started last week with got the it. We're starting with Chris. and the nihilism and just sadness. All right, well, then it's your turn. Yes, I'm here to take you along the Golden Road. We are not going the Yellow Brick Road, not the Golden Road. That's a brewery in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles beer sucks. Also, it was uh, a game on Price is Right, wasn't it, the Golden Road? <laughs> it could have been. It could have been. Uh, who was hosting that one? Was that, uh, was that Bob Hope? That was Bob Barker. Oh, Bob Barker, that's right. He's younger. Um, no, we're going on the Yellow Brick Road. We're going to see the wizard. Um because that's my gig here. I'm I'm the fan who is rosy and loves it, uh, no matter what the Padres do. I I stand AJ Preller. <laughs> he is my he is my prince. Also my prince, Mike Schilt with his career 559 winning percentage. He got the raw deal in St. Louis from an organization that is completely adrift, and he landed here in San Diego where he became AJ Preller's right hand man. They hired him. After Bob Melvin gave uh, uh, the synergy, the the unsynergy, we heard nothing last year except for how the front office and the managers uh, and the clubhouse were clashing. How there was uh, a bunch of uh, differences in opinion between AJ Preller and Bob Melvin. How there were personality clashes. I don't think we're going to hear any of that this year because this is Mike Schultz's team, and I am optimistic. Uh, that's one of the reasons. Things we said last year, I've already gone into this a little bit. We were upset about two DHs on the team. We were upset about Rudin and Odor. Uh, Fernando Tatis was coming back from a rough injury. Uh, we were upset Xander Bogarts was playing shortstop over our beloved Hassan Kim. Uh, we were upset that the team had signed questionable vets in the starting rotation and Michael Waka and Seth Lugo. Um, this year, we're not worried about any of those things. Xander Bogarts is playing second base. They're not signing anybody, so definitely not old questionable vets. And they're, you know, we've got nothing but young guys with years of team control in the starting rotation. So this is what gets me optimistic, guys. And this is where my projection is going to lead to. Um, I don't think this opening day lineup is going to be what the team ends up with, even at the trade deadline. It, the free agency has been completely insane. There's still quality guys on the board. I'm not saying the team is going to sign them, but as these numbers fall, I do think a fit could occur. And while I'm making these projections, understand that I am putting my faith in a little bit of AJ Preller magic. And I am putting my faith in team ownership uh, to take a path that it's a little different from what they've done so far. I'm trusting them to try to win baseball games. I'm trusting them to try to win championships. I hope that culture, people criticize the Padres culture, you know, even last year. But I'm hoping that what was started by Peter Seidler has actually gone into the Petri dish within the building there at Petco Park. And the one thing that it has created is a desire to win a championship, a desire to have a parade. So I just want to do a couple of reminders. The Padres were 15 games over 500 uh, at the trade deadline in uh, 2021. That year's opening day lineup, Tommy Pham, Fernando Tatis, Manny Machado, Eric Hosmer, Will Myers, Jacob Cronenworth, Jerickson Profar, Victor Carantini, and because there's no DH, Hugh Darvish. I think this year's club is better than that. I know you guys, I know there are question marks, but I do believe in the team's young talent, and I I think that they are gonna live up to their expectations. The next year, they're 10 games over 500 going into the trade deadline. They went out and made massive moves. The team completely changed its identity being a winning team two years in a row. And that lineup was Austin Nola leading off. Uh, Manny Machado, Jacob Cronenworth batting third. Whoa, kind of oddly prescient. Luke Voigt, Will Myers, Eric Hosmer, Jerks, and Profar Hassan Kim, Trent Grisham. 
I think that our lineup with Xander Bogarts filling one of those spots alone is going to lead to a better lineup in, than both of those teams. In uh, 2022, I gave a completely unsolicited best case scenario of 98 wins for that team. Uh, they wound up winning 89, so I was a little bit short. Last year, we're not going to talk about our best case from last year because I believe I said that the team could set a franchise record in wins. This year, I don't think that's going to happen. This year, I think the best case for the San Diego Padres, and this is going to seem high to you guys, but <laughs> like I said, worst clubs have been 10 games over 500 at the trade deadline. They've been 15 games over 500 at the trade deadline. They've made moves. The team has changed. I think with the core that the Padres have, that they've invested in, Manny Machado, Xander Bogart, Fernando Tatis Jr., ha Sung Kim even, Joe Musgrove, Hugh Darvish, I think these guys are star Major League Baseball players. And San Diego still has them because the investment Peter Seiler made into it. I think last year they ate a big old piece of humble pie. They are all competitors. Last year was disgraceful to them. I think they come into this year wearing that disgrace and wanting to change the narrative on their careers. I think Xander Bogarts wants to win another championship. I think he wants to win one at second base. I think Manny Machado wants to go back to the NLCS. I think Fernando Tatis Jr. wants to leave behind uh, 2022 completely. And I think a lot of guys, are there, they just want to make some money and, and go out there and perform uh, because that's what drives them. I think the best case scenario is this team defies all expectations and wins 89 games this year. My God, with all of that Wait. ramp up, you wound up at 89. <laughs> Wait, like that was like the Gettysburg Address and you got to 89 and 73. 89 and 73. Wait, hang on. Who who are you and what have you done with Chris Reed? Yeah. Like, that's your best case? 89 wins? I think so. It's in a tough... The whole thing is the rest of the division has gotten very hard. The rest of the division has gotten very good. Fair. And that's while fair. they they don't play everybody as much as they used to, 89 wins will be the first place wild card. Very likely. Unless, you know, the Philadelphia Phillies and Atlanta Braves really run away with the East. You know, those there might be a 91-92 win wild card, but 89 is probably, if it's not one, it's a very close two. And that's what the goal is for this team, is to get into the wild card uh, with their rotation intact. Maybe a Mazer comes up or an Iriarte comes up at that point and his lights out, and that's how they make the deep run to the playoffs. I'm not trying to view this through rose tinted glasses, right? Um, but I, I think this team, my best case back in 2022 was 89. And I think it's, they're just as likely to do that this year. All right, Rafi, I turn the floor to you. Okay. Um, wow. I just want to say I'm really surprised because I feel like I am the dour one typically. And, and, <laughs> and Chris is the one who is, uh, you know, always just kind of, you know, given the optimistic take. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go way past what, what Chris said. So again, I just want to say the, the caveat is, you know, we don't say, oh, we win 162 games or like, oh, like the Padres win the World Series. Everyone knows that that's the best case scenario. Like the oh, championship is the best case scenario. I just want to talk about what the individual people are going to do. And that will lead to the end result, which is the win total I'm going to give. But like, are you going to predict what... that Luis Camposano sees the ball better with his new stance? <laughs> so I'm getting I'm getting there. I'm getting okay. there. All right. Sorry. So I'm excited. Uh, you've got me really hyped, Ravy. Okay, so here's what the, our individuals need to do. Uh, I've talked about this before. Xander Bogarts basically repeats Marcus Semien's season from last year at second base. Uh, Marcus Semien hit 276, 348, 478, 29 home runs, went on to put up 6.3 F4 
the you know just is an absolute beast you know probably I, i'm guessing in that situation he's the best second baseman in the nl uh you know transitions flawlessly he and you know and Hassan kim are you know making pivots and flipping balls to each other and it's just you know butch and sundance in the middle of the infield everything's uh happy so uh so xander with his leadership is going to start us off there um fernando tatis jr completes his comeback has a ronald acuna jr like season uh i'm going to read for you what uh zips projected as fernando tatis jr's 80th percentile outcome for the season um his 80th percentile stat line that's projected is 295 367 on base percentage with a 593 slug that's a 167 ops plus and that equates to 7.4 F4. He would be receiving MPV, MVP votes. And it's the, the statue contract Tatis that we all have been dreaming on ever since he broke with the team in 2019. Um, the Padres win three gold gloves this year. That would be Xander Bogarts at second base. That would be Fernando Tatis Jr. in right field. And that would be Hassan Kim at shortstop. Here's another one. Jackson Merrill wins Rookie of the Year votes. I'm not going to say he wins Rookie of the Year. That's <laughs> that is a a, a uh, you know a bar that I just like even for the optimism pod. Like I don't I don't think it's there. But let's just say he gets some votes. That would be a major major optimistic outcome. Here's another one. Drixon Profar wins Comeback Player of the Year. Oh, oh, I, I love all right. that. I love all it. Right. You are so high. This is the optimism podcast. <laughs> don't don't shit on my optimism. This no, is the I'm one time noting, I'm noting your elevation. That's I'm not <laughs> yes. shitting on This is what I was saying. I was like, wow, am I going to be the crackpot coming in here today? No, I didn't I realize love that one, Rafi. Yeah, yeah. So Jerks and Profile wins comeback player of the years. Which, by the way, I mean, if he puts up like two war, like <laughs> that's gonna- a. That's a four war swing. So yeah, I, just wanna, I just want to. I was going to say, there. what does it honestly take? Three war. And yeah, then like, I don't know. A, a slam dunk? Yeah. Yo, definitely three war. Um, you know, but even two wars is even worth a conversation. Uh, speaking of, uh, you, you brought, you've invoked his name already. Luis Campusano wins the NL Silver Slugger at catcher. Okay. Oh. I think that that one is just so, just crazy enough that it might work. Okay. I'm going to again read his 80th percentile uh, zips projections for Luis Campusano. That's a 286 uh, batting average, 341 on base, 461 slug. It's a 126 OPS plus. I don't know if that gets it done, um, but it it would be close, and I would be really intrigued by this idea. Um, Manny Machado becomes the Padres' all-time home run leader. I actually think that that's a pretty reasonable uh, prediction. He only needs 26 to pass Nate Colbert because we have the saddest franchise records of any major <laughs> league baseball team. Yes. Um, so he's currently sitting at 138. Colbert's at 163. Ooh. I think he probably passes that if he's if he doesn't pass that. That's the pessimism podcast because now we're talking about a situation where Machado's not healing, etc. We did that last week. Uh, here's another one. No, no, Joe, electric boogaloo. All right. Yeah. Joe Musgrove throws his second no hitter. This time at Peco Park at home, which buoys his sub three ERA. Okay, um, I'm gonna do uh, one that I also think could be. Uh, you Rafi, know, uh, you know uh, what? Was- right now, I'm tasting oh. oysters. Yeah, he tasted oh, oysters. God. I think he might oh. be having a stroke. Is what's happening? But we'll uh, <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> tend to agree. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna say the farm contributes, and what that means to me on the pitching side is that Drew Thorpe, Hiro Iriarte, and Adam Mazur. All put all contribute at least one war each. I don't think that that's insane, um, but I do think that that is a, a very optimistic outcome for us. We've already talked about it. The cauldron bubbles. I'm gonna. I picked out uh, Matt Waldron. Uh, I, I looked up Tim Wakefield's best season, which was uh, you know 2003, in which he put up a 4.09 ERA, but threw 200 innings. Um, I don't think Matt Waldron's gonna throw 200 innings for the Padres. Uh, but a 4.09 ERA at 140, 150 innings, amazing outcome for uh, for uh, Matt Waldron there. Um, I'm going to bang through the rest of these really quickly. Michael King throws 150 innings for us. Um, uh, regression comes from the for the NL West. The clutch, as I talked about last last week, and what if it doesn't come back? What if it does? What if it what if it does? In fact, and it swings all the way back in the other direction. 
Uh, as a reminder, the Padres were 8.95 uh, unclutch wins last year. And the Diamondbacks, which worth saying, 6.43 wins on the lucky side. So if you swing that, it's 15 wins. I mean, it's a, it's a ridiculous, ridiculous win total that w- we saw in a fluctuation last year. Um, you know, Giants have failure to launch, et cetera, et cetera. And for the Dodgers, the Dodgers defense, which we have seen in spring training, is it, it's I, I don't have an infield like they yeah, like I, yeah. the, their bet is that they're going to they're going to score 20,000 runs a game. And it's not going to matter if if Gavin Lux, you know, flubs three throws to first base every game. Um, and so I, you know, Dodgers defense and injury luck is worse than we thought. Um, so this is my optimistic prediction. Um, again, this is th- listen to the scenario I've just laid out. OK, yeah, um, it's ludicrous. It's Amazing. ludicrous. It's ludicrous. Delicious. Um, my w- my win total is not I I, I, if if all of these things happened, my win total, the win total would be a lot higher than what I'm actually going to say. Th- this is the truly like one like a one percent outcome for the Padres this year. Ninety five wins. Ninety five wins. And I and I yeah. still so it's ninety five and sixty seven, and honestly, I still don't think that that wins the division. I think what that means no. is that we took a lot of games off the Diamondbacks and the Giants, who were pretenders, and we were the real deal. And the Dodgers still win the division with like one hundred and one wins or something like that. Um, but uh, that's my again, incredibly. I I don't want you to anyone to think this is what I think will happen. But that's Rafe, my very you let optimistic. The joy consume you. I get to do it let one it time a year. You Ninety-five wins, Craig. All right. Um, I'll, I'll you know I'll keep it short. Obviously, ev- and anything great could happen to any of these players. Um, and if everyone plays at their top, then the team's going to be good. I'll echo a couple of things. I think any best case scenario for the Padres involves two of their big three playing to a 75% or better uh, Zips projection. So for me, I'll go with Toddy and Xander for those two guys. I just can't, even in a best case scenario, I can't see Manny having a great year this year, but I think he just kind of is a steady Eddie for the Padres. Uh, For the Padres to have a best case scenario year, Jake Cronenworth, I can't believe none of you guys mentioned Jake Cronenworth. Jake Cronenworth. (laughs) Must must get traded to the Dodgers, make the All Star game, oh. or come very close to it. Jake Cronenworth is being asked to be the best left handed hitter on this team. He has to be the best left handed hitter on this team in order for a best case scenario projection to work out. So, uh, in in my fantasy world, Tatis is just like your guys is fighting for an MVP. Bogarts is having an all-star season. Whether he earns the team or not, he has an all-star season. Jake Cronenworth has a good season. He has a season akin to 2021 for the Padres. He's driving in runs. He's pesky. He's patient. He he thrives batting in between either Bogarts or Tatis and Machado and has the year that I hoped he had last year, but he has it this year. Michael King is outstanding and gives the Padres a one, two, three. That's just as good, essentially, as last year. Because remember, you Darvish was not very good last year. Yeah. And Joe Musgrove was only around for fewer than 100 innings. So you, you kind of even out those guys performance. And Michael King doesn't win the Cy Young, but he's really good. He's very, very solid. He's better than a number three starter. And so the Padres really do have a top three that's extremely solid. Their infield defense is just rock solid. They they just play the best infield defense of any team in the National League. It's a it's a vacuum out there. In my best case scenario, Jackson Merrill bats ninth and he isn't demoted as the year goes on. He he just he treads water. He hangs in. He doesn't fail. He winds up with like a 675 OPS, but he plays a, a qualified center field. He, he does a good enough job. He, he gets hits in the nine spot instead of trying to draw bases loaded walks with two outs and, and punching out on, on fastballs down the middle. He actually gets hits for the team, and those hits wind up being important. Uh, 
Yuki Matsui takes over for Robert Suarez right away as closer. Even in my best case scenario, Robert Suarez sucks. So (laughs) hopefully that's wrong. (laughs) But Yuki Matsui takes over for Robert Suarez at the first available opportunity, strikes out the side to get the save, never looks back, puts up 28 saves this year uh, in the bullpen for the San Diego Padres and is, is very effective is, is even considered for an all-star berth, but he doesn't make it. Um, King is good. We mentioned him. A minor leaguer comes up. That's definitely a part of my best case scenario is that one of what, one of the, the Waldron Brito group doesn't quite make it to the finish line, but somebody comes up and takes that spot, whether it's Thorpe or Ariarte, somebody by the second half is humming in one of those spots. And all of a sudden the Padres have a really good starting rotation. Uh, All of these things take place. And the Padres with Mike Schilt getting a lucky year. Luck is bouncing back. They win 91 games. They go 91 and 71. Uh, That I, I wanted to make sure that my error bars were properly wide this year. Because I thought one of, you know, HJ criticizes everything we do, but uh, one that I thought was very valid last year was that our error bars were far too narrow for all three of us, that we, we had things in too tight of a band. So mine now stretches from 68 to 91 in terms of, of the bottom of my error bar and the top of my error bar. Typical uh, spreadsheet baseball. Le- leaves a lot of room in the middle for where the Padres probably will wind up. But I think Schilt. Lucky team, bottom of the order doesn't implode, and a couple of the big three have huge seasons, and importantly, importantly, Jake Cronenworth has a good, a really good season. Yeah, then the Padres put it all together, and they put up a Schilt number. Like Mike Schilt, he just, what does he do? He wins 88 to 91 games. That's what the man does, yeah. and Mike Schilt wins 91 games, and as a result of that, Mike Schilt wins manager of the year in the National League, his second NL Manager of the Year award. His uh, career percentage of 559 correlates to like 89 and a half wins. So basically exactly that. I do, I, and great point on Cronenworth, dude, considering that he has been up in the lineup before and he's going to be a major piece this year, batting third or second or wherever they're going to put him. I want to ask you guys, we barely touched on the bullpen. I feel like I didn't touch on the bullpen because it, I just kind of perceive it as a strength. I think Tom Cosgrove is going to return, maybe not to as good as he was last year, but the dude is a stud. I think Steven Wilson will continue to dominate right-handed hitters. Uh, Yuki Matsui, uh, a very pleasant uh, spring training. Um, well, when he starts going, uh, he hasn't done anything yet, but I think he's been a very pleasant addition. Um, where, where do you guys land on that? Do you think that the bullpen is the strength of this team? Uh, I really don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. I mean, ahead, well, are, are we talking optimism or are we talking? Yeah, what do I really this think? is the optimism podcast. Yeah. Robert and, Suarez is at least, um, he's 80% as good as he was in the playoffs during the wild card round. In, in the optimism world, uh, Yuki Matsui is Luke Gregerson and Robert Suarez is Heath Bell. Like that's, oh. that's like the, that's like the great outcome for this, like for that one, two punch. And like you said, like all there's all the other contributors who are, uh, uh, you know, at that level as well. They even say um, Wandy. Yeah. Like one, I mean, Wandy's like a great lefty specialist guy. He's not, he's not as like all around as Yuki Matsui in this scenario. Um, the, the thing about the bullpen is like, I actually do think that we have some intriguing minor leaguers who could contribute there if things don't work out with the the group of guys that we have. And there's very, aside from Suarez, you know, I, I don't think that there's like as much to lose. I, I, I mean, like Matsui obviously is getting paid like four mil a year and then Peralta is getting paid four mil a year. But like, you know, that's kind of the extent of, of, of the damage. I mean, everyone else is either on like one or $2 million deals or they're making the league minimum. Um, so there is some flexibility there if things don't work out that we don't have on other parts of the roster because we're locked into guys for, you know, many, many, many years to come. So I'm, I'm weirdly not tripping as much about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know what? 
last year, another one of the going through those three podcasts, I thought one of the biggest leaks that I personally had was I didn't think about the bullpen enough. Uh, and I just kind of was, I, I think I even remember saying at some point, like, I'm, I'm not worried about the bullpen. The bullpen's going to be fine. And then the bullpen was not fine. Like the bullpen was a major part of the reason why the team went 82 and 80 last year and needed to win 14 of the last 16 to get there. It was a nightmare in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning for the Padres last year. I, this is the optimism show, so I'm just not going to, I'm, I'm not going to go all over it. I just, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't think anybody can, can look at this group and say with any certainty how they're going to perform. And if, if Suarez tanks, if he's not a capable closer, the whole thing unravels because now who's now your ninth inning guy. Okay. Well now what is it? Wandy is Wandy a full-time closer. That's why in my best case scenario was Matt Suey. He just like steps forward like a shining knight and just goes, I'll take that ball and start striking out dudes and, and becomes a reliable closer. This team won't go anywhere without a reliable closer. See, uh, I, my best case is closer by committee and they're playing the matchups on a, you know, a near nightly basis. Yeah. And maybe yeah. that's how Mike does it. Yeah. I just, I just think also last year, like the bullpen was a problem, but the bullpen was a problem because Suarez was hurt most of the year and we were hampered by a uh, closer who would hey, only pitch one inning. So we were, we were rules. kind of playing with one arm behind our back the entire, you know, for like four months of the season uh, from a bullpen standpoint. And, and I just, we just don't have those limitations this year. So I, while the talent level isn't as high without hater there, like I just think the flexibility does offer some sort of plus to buoy that. Yeah. So 95, 91, and from happy, 89. I, cu- I could not believe <laughs> that, Chris. Like, like, where's the imagination, guys? Come on. I, like I said, I, I know my error bars are low. I'm just not afraid of being wrong. And I'm trying to give my, like, objective take on where the team could go this year. No objective. There's no I'm objective so in objective. Optimism Week. Purely objective. I have an analytical mind. Indeed. As everyone says, many people are saying. <laughs> the pe- all yeah. the people are saying it. The best people are saying that I have the best analytical genius mind on the streets. Before we leave, Rafi, what, uh, we, we asked our, our yeah. great patrons on Discord for some of their optimistic predictions and projections. Uh, what, what's a sampling of the best of that? I see a gift that says we will give you $10. Okay, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still. I'm That's still it. Going Just ten dollars. Yeah. Uh, so uh, J A Rin uh, has uh, submitted saying Waldron becomes knuckle god. Ha Sung becomes our rightful king and gets key to the city after hitting 394 and going six war. Padres win the World Series in five. Um, you know Ha Sung is life. Of course, says Ha Sung. Our Lord Kim has an MVP caliber season. Very little Kim talk in our in our three of us. By the way, I think we're just kind of a given that he would have a great year in this situation. Manny Xander Crone all renegotiate to give some of their unearned salary largesse to extend Ha Sung Kim long term. That is very <laughs> optimistic. Um, Go Pods said 90 percentile outcomes for Fernando X and Manny. Pitching staff is healthy. King has 180 innings pitch and is top five in NL Cy Young. Merrill mm. wins the NL Rookie of the Year. Pauly, Waldron, and Bruto are surprise three war players. Okay, maybe their imagination in our Discord is a little bit higher I than I love <laughs> these. I love everyone. Yeah. You guys are slaying this. Olaf is berserker. Uh, said similar to what I said. Tatis duplicates Acuna season from a year ago. You know, everyone stays healthy. X is the second coming of Jeff Kent at second base. Uh, wow. AJ's bullpen Very pieces Solana are cheap, cheap and effective. Uh, Manny steps into the leadership role he should have had last year. Padres don't trade Kim because they need him for the playoffs. Uh, basically, the team is well constructed. Club wins one for Pete. Um, but let's see what else. I'm just trying to go through some good samples. <laughs> um, Dane said Brian Kenny apologizes to Joe Musgrove. <laughs> I like that one a lot. Um, D. Turgeon says Tatis, Machado, Bogarts, Kim, Darvish, Joe, and Campy are all stars, and the Padres win 94 games to come in second in the division to the Dodgers just to beat them in the NLDS en route to a World Series championship. Tatis with the bat flip heard round the world when he walks it off in game seven. Uh, and then just some other quick hits because uh, some people had some longer ones. Four Tops Fever uh, had, a, had one that I really like. Ethan Salas does not appear in the major leagues. I think that that's yes. a good, uh, that's a good one worth 
worth shouting out. Um, you know, had had some Cronenworth shout outs, like everything like that. Um, <laughs> I like that. Hi, my name is Vic. His number one optimistic point was we offload Jake's contract before he hits a low point. Not even that Jake <laughs> turns it around. Just that we're, just that we he gets sell him traded off. to the Dodgers and then is Dodge Cronenworth thing for the Dodgers. Yeah. Um. So yeah, a lot of Merrill Rookie of the Year center field, um, Azakar yes. slash Profar become a great left field duo that also hit above two fifty. Um, so that's good. Uh, Rich says that Grand Poly becomes the one ten WRC plus bat the Padres hoping to become, and is the every uh, day answer at DH. Uh, Yuki Matsui is a revelation and becomes the second coming of Kaz Suzaki while saving forty games. Uh, Jackson Merrill turns out to be an all-star. Michael King throws 160 innings. Uh, Campusano puts together a 110 start season when introduces to his to himself to the league, establishing himself as one of the best offensive catchers in the National League. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, Oscar Mercado slugs when we win a World Series and John Gennaro gets a dispensation from his job to return as co-host to the pod. Joining the three of you, I would love that. Um, and let's see. Uh, Schilt is the piece we need to start over. Yeah, a lot of Mike Schilt love from Friar Goose. Um, and that's that's kind of the sampling of uh of our Discord from uh, our crowdsourcing. A lot of optimism there. Uh, indeed, and and you know, I, I I think I've said it on the radio show too. So I mean, I will echo one thing that you guys said. Like a, a best case scenario, Luis Camposano at worst is like a top five catcher in the National League, and. At best, he's fighting for a National League All-Star spot. I wouldn't think even if he deserved it, he did it. But like maybe he's like an All-Star snub. You know, like the guy who had better numbers than Will Smith, but Will Smith went because he's a Dodger and he drove in Otani a bunch of times, you know. Uh, and, and like I could see that happening because I do think he has the opportunity to have a really good offensive season. Um, it's just he's never obviously done it in the big leagues for more than a month or two. So wild optimism abounds. This has been a lot of fun. I do enjoy it. Uh, next week, we wrap up the trilogy. And we get to our third body problem, which is <laughs> what is the what is the actual record going to be? We've, we've gone to the de depths of despair. We've gone to the heights of hyperbole. Uh, where where do we actually think the team lines up? Uh, we will do that a week from tonight. Uh, any closing thoughts, gentlemen, before we wrap up festivities? Um, I really want the Padres to do well this year. It'd be great. It'd be fun. Um, uh, the only thing I have to add is go Padres. The thing to add, go Padres. That's what I said. Well, then go Padres. <laughs> <laughs>